Hey guys, my name is Andre Bearfield. Thank you for joining the webinar. I think we we're gonna like I think we're gonna chill here for just a couple seconds as a few more attendees join. But we'll get started in just a few. All right, folks. Again, thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, Eddie, will you go to the next slide? Uh, I don't think full screen is going to work. We have to do it like this. Oh, OK, cool. Um, so my name is Andre Bearfield. I am the product owner for Digital Oceans Managed Databases Platform. And I'm joined here by Eddie Zin Zineski, who is a developer relations leader on the DigitalOcean team as well. Hello. And the agenda slide. So today we are going to introduce you to DigitalOcean's managed databases platform. I'll start by providing a brief overview of the service. Um, and then Eddie's going to jump into uh, a demo and walk through of the production and, and pretty good uh, the, in the, to the Sorry, I jump into a demo of the product um, in pretty good amount of detail. And after the demo, I will talk through the roadmap uh, as it stands today. And then we'll close out the meeting um, with um, some Q&A. So giving you guys a chance to ask some questions. Um, but you should be asking questions in the chat throughout the meeting. Um, there are some other DOers on the line that may be able to answer in real, real time, but some of them may need to wait until the end um, of the meeting. Overview slide. And the next. All right. So what is Digital Ocean Managed Databases? So DO Managed Databases is a simple database platform intended to reduce the operational overhead of managing applications in the cloud. So we're providing a fully managed and scalable database cluster that doesn't require users to engage on the administration of the infrastructure. So we got into this, uh, we determined to go down the path of building managed databases um, after doing a lot of research and talking to a lot of DigitalOcean customers. And what we heard from users is that there's a number of key pain points um, that come up pretty regularly in the process of rolling and de delivering your own database platform or database solution. So DigitalOcean Managed Databases takes care of the most common challenges that many businesses and developers face when they're building a database solution from the ground up. Um, we engage with customers and what we understood from them um, are simple issues like identifying the optimal database infrastructure footprint. And there's a, num a, a, a high amount of trepidation around choosing the right size footprint um, as, you, as users and, and businesses uh, kick off new projects. Um, there's also a, a number of challenges around scaling infrastructure as businesses grow, as data, mis data requirements grow. Um, designing and managing highly available infrastructure and failover processes. So naturally, especially for um, applications that have high uptime requirements, um, the desire is to 
make sure that those services and certainly access to the database tier is up all the time. And it's incredibly challenging to build your own solution for that problem. And certainly um, there is not necessarily a need for every user to build their own solution for this problem. Implementing and implementing a complete and reliable backup and recovery strategy is another thing that came up frequently in our interviews. Um, it's, an, it's much like the high availability problem where there are some known solutions for this, but there are many, many iterations and examples of them in the market. Um, and, and it's really difficult <laughs> to find out after you've built a backup solution um, and you need to actually restore to backup um, that something may have, have, have gone awry and you may have challenges reaching those backups. And then finally, um, what we learned from our interviews is that forecasting and maintaining operational infrastructure costs um, is, is, a, is a real big challenge. So understanding in the long term what the cost of the infrastructure will be and also managing the operational overhead um, of having the right people that understand top to bottom the right way to deal with uh, the infrastructure up through the database um, application. Next slide. So it is our intent at DigitalOcean to simplify these challenges with DO's managed databases platform. So some of the key features that we are intending to deliver and have made available for you today is that we're offering a service that will definitely save you time. We allow users to quickly deploy a database cluster and we handle most of the rest of the problem. Don't worry about security or patching um, the OS or the database engine. Once a new version of um, database engines become available or security or OS patches become available, DigitalOcean will handle the heavy lifting on those, on those areas. Managed databases are highly secure and optimized for performance. All of the data in, is encrypted at rest and in transit. And users can use cloud firewalls to enable the connections that only are required to get to the database infrastructure. In addition to those security features, databases run on enterprise class VM hardware with SSD storage. So that's gonna be lightning fast performance, which is in some ways pretty unique to the market um, that we're in, where in most cases persistent disk is used. We've also made scalability really easy. Um, the right size of the infrastructure can be a moving target. Earlier I mentioned that there is trepidation on, user, on users and developers and businesses as they try to find that right size for projects in their infancy stage. So a DO managed databases tries to remove that problem. You can scale up your database at any time with virtually no impact to the running application. We also handle automatic failover for our customers. It's we so one of the things that we heard, one of the key jobs that users wanted to solve is I want to sleep through the night without worrying about my application being up in the morning. So certainly on the database side of things, managed databases allow users to sleep easy, knowing that if an issue occurs with their database cluster, traffic will be automatically, automatically rerouted to a standby node and replacement nodes for any nodes with issue will be put into service without any interruption. Um, this element is conditional because it is not necessarily required that you select a high availability service, but it is our explicit recommendation that users that have applications that have strict, really uh, strict uptime requirements definitely lean towards high availability options. And then finally, we don't think it's a good idea to build your own backup solution. So much so that we determined to handle backups totally for you with no additional fee. So backups for all of your database services are included free of charge. A full backup is taken every day in, in addition to write ahead logs that are captured minute by minute and are maintained to allow you to restore 
your database service to any point in time within the seven day retention period. So we're really excited to be able to put this into the hands of our users. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Eddie Zaneski now to provide a live demonstration of managed databases. Eddie. Thanks, Andre. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Andre said, uh, my name is Eddie Zaneski, and I serve the developer community here at DigitalOcean. Uh, you might remember me from such hits as our Kubernetes webinar. Uh, if anyone is joining who was there as well, thanks again for hanging out with us. Uh, I'm going to fire off a poll on this thing real quick, and I'm not sure if it's going to work, uh, but we're going to see. So uh, I shot out a poll. If you could, on a scale of zero to four, with a zero being you're not using Postgres at all, and a four being you are an expert with Postgres, uh, if you wouldn't mind picking one of those, uh, just so we have, you know, know how to tell this content a little bit better. Wish I had like some Jeopardy music playing. Do, 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 do. Cool. All right. Thank you for those of you that have voted. It seems we like got people right in the middle at like a two. That's awesome. Uh, a couple beginners. That's great. And no one here considers themselves an expert, uh, which is fine. Cool. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see those results, but it is 68% have voted a two. Uh, and so I'm just going to jump right into our product then, and I'll give you a quick run through. Uh, so when you log into your dashboard, uh, you know, just like everything else on the left-hand side here, you can go right to our databases. And at the top, you can also come up here to create a new database. So let's start with doing that. And here you get to choose your engine, just like with all of our droplets, you get to choose your OS and different bits. Uh, so we'll start out with Postgres, uh, we'll do Postgres 10. And then down here, you know, we've kept the very straightforward, clean, easy to use UI that presents you with you know, the questions that matter for you to get uh, your database up and running. So you can pick your node size. So we'll get like a, a $30 a month um, main node here, primary node. And then as Andre was saying, we have the option of adding one to two standby nodes, depending on high, uh, how highly available you want your cluster to be. And then down here, you've seen this UI before, I'm sure. You can pick the data center you want to deploy out to. Uh, and then you know you pop in a name for your database. Uh, and just like that, you know, you've answered a few questions, and we give you a managed database cluster. So I'm going to fire this off. Uh, it's going to go off in the background. And we're going to use one that I've already created here. So I've created a, uh, a big, beefy cluster here with two standby nodes. And this is the screen you're presented with after your database is spun up. Uh, and also, if there's any questions, anything at all, stop, you know, drop them in the chat and we'll get them answered. Uh, I'm not really sure if I can see that, but someone is monitoring that and will yell at me if you say anything. So once you've spun up your first database, uh, you know, we have this nice little wizard UI to get you started. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to secure down your database. So if there's any uh, DigitalOcean resources that you want to whitelist. Uh, this is where you will pick them. You know, if you want to put your IP or a block or any of your servers, right? So this is where you can come in there and you know you can actually whitelist your entire Kubernetes cluster. So that'll get all of your Kubernetes nodes too. Uh, and so after you've done your inbound source whitelisting, uh, we give you your connection strings. So you know here's those connection parameters if you want to grab them right off the bat. Here's a string if you just want to copy and paste this. This is probably the one that most of your uh, tools and you know, your drivers will want to use. And then there's also the flags version, where this is like a straight command line version. Uh, and then just like that, we give you a few other things to play with in this wizard. So go on through and read after you get your hands on it. Uh, I'll show you some of the more important bits. So just like above, here's that connection string. This is what you're going to need to actually connect. Uh, the run rate for your cluster, securing those inbound connections. Uh, and then we have our maintenance window. And so this is where we'll install some, install some mandatory updates to your database cluster. You know, you can pick that window at a time that you desire. So maybe you want to do like Fridays at like 5 p.m. to piss off your entire ops team. You could do that too if something goes wrong, right? But uh, we give you the option to pick, you know, whatever time you want, and we'll handle those updates for you. And then down here, you see I have a read-only node. We'll talk about that in a second. But you see your, your read-only nodes will be listed down here. A couple docs. Uh, our docs team did a great job putting together a ton of Postgres resources, so be sure to check those out. 
Uh, and then at the top, we'll look at these tabs. So these are the metrics that we show. So you know, some CPU load average and your storage. Um, you've probably seen this before if you use, used our monitoring for your droplets. So you can get a good idea into what's going on. It's not really a black box. You know, obviously the storage one is definitely one you want to keep your eye on, as well as the memory. Um, and then you know, you can pick a different time period, right? So straightforward, you can click around in here. These are some logs and query statistics. So um, I don't have any in this database, but let's pop open a different one. And th what I really like about this is you can see an aggregate of the queries that are hitting your database. OK, there's none in this one either. Um, but there are the, some past ones that I've ran. Right? So I, I've inserted into contacts for this demo app about 50 times. And here are some you know, average performance metrics of that uh, insertion, right? And same thing with like reading from the database, right? So you can see how this will get powerful as you have queries that are continuously running. You'll be coming, you'll be able to come in here and like optimize and look for those bottlenecks. And then, so that's the logs and queries. Uh, just like Andre said, we run, we run backups on your database uh, once a day, and you know you can restore from those backups at any point in time. And I've hit a cluster limit on this demo account. Uh, but you could restore from those backups if you, you know, want to roll back or you had a bad migration, something went wrong. And then we give you an easy to use UI here for users and databases. So if you want to add like an app user to your database, uh, we'll create that for you. Right now it has all the kind of super users permissions and grants. So if you want to apply any specific like ACLs or grants for certain databases, you'll have to do that by hand. Um, and same thing with like creating a database. So here we can create a, you know, powers database or something, right? And, and it'll run those commands and it'll uh, let you control them all from here. You can delete and manage these users. So, you know, as we build this UI out, uh, you can imagine how much more useful this will get. Uh, I'm going to skip connection pooling for now because that's a, a bit to talk about. And then we can look at our uh, connection, our settings, right? So this is our cluster setting. So here we can come in and resize the cluster if we want. Obviously, we can't go down, but we can go up. Uh, we can change the data center it's located in. We can uh, look at those whitelisted inbound sources that we mentioned before, obviously destroy. And then at the top here is where we can do things like add a read-only node. And so this will let you add a read-only node to your cluster uh, in whatever region you want uh, and spin it up so you can you know, obviously have a closer uh, database for your users or, or wherever your applications are just deployed. Uh, and the other thing we can do is we can fork a database. Uh, this is something great that you'll want to have your ops teams do maybe if you want to run a big migration on live data. Maybe you want to take your production uh, data and fork it into your staging environment so you're actually working with live information, right? So this will uh, be able to fork a database so you can play with it and, you know, not um, mess up your production data. You know, data. And then uh, back to connection pooling. So this is where things get a bit confusing but really powerful. And so uh, our, our databases have a connection limit in here. Uh, I think it's I think it's 25 per one gigabyte of RAM. So I have four gigs in this server up here. Uh, and so we reserve three connections, which is why it's off by three, uh, for uh, maintenance. And then outside of that, uh, there's a kind of like a hard cap on our connection limits. And so there's a really good article in here about um, how large should my connection pool be. It talks more about pool sizing. Um, You'll definitely want to read the docs on this. Uh, the TLDR is that a connection is a is a fork in your database, right? And so that takes up, um, I think it's like a uh, hundred megabytes, ten megabytes of. It's in here somewhere, but it takes up a ten megabytes of RAM, uh, which is insignificant in itself. But if you have many connections opening to your database, uh, you can see how quickly that adds up, right? So if we have 100 connections on our database at 10 gigs of RAM. You know, we're already taking up a huge chunk of the RAM on our server just for you know connections alone on this database. And so to solve this, we we put uh, basically PG Bouncer in the mix. And so what this lets you do is create a connection pool. And so a connection pool can take one of those connections and kind of make it reusable up to 5,000 clients. And so um, there's a lot to go over here. You'll definitely want to read the docs. Um, 
you know, we recommend the transaction pool mode. Uh, again, the docs are really well done here. And then, you know, you pick your pool size and this will keep your pool connection open based on your, your server connections. Uh, and so this, this really lets you scale out your database connection. And so I think in the docs, we have a, a good explanation of why you might want to use a connection pool, right? So if you handle a, a large number of idle connections, right? So that connection is continuously open. You don't want to be eating up that RAM for your, your server and, you know, possibility of a large number of connections, maybe doing serverless where, you know, you have a bunch of functions that connect, run a query and, and run off. Uh, it's really good to run those in PG Bouncer. So go on and read the docs. Uh, it's a pretty powerful feature. Uh, bit to explain. And so uh, that's the major walkthrough for the UI. Uh, I have a few things I want to show. We have, uh, so again, I'm going to say it again. Check out the docs. We'll make sure to give out everyone a link there. Uh, there's a ton of information in here. And we have a GitHub repo that we've put together with a bunch of different examples. Um, Pop in here if you you know you, you have questions about connecting to a Postgres database if you've never used Postgres before you know we have an example for like Go No Laravel Python right some just some very straightforward quick starts uh, so check those out and then there's one more thing I want to point out uh, besides from restoring from a backup out uh, the resource center and this. Uh, it's not the link I'm looking for. There we go. Where is the resource center? Uh, okay, we'll make sure to get a, a link out, but it's basically a collection of some resources we put together, including a YouTube video that someone ran actually walking through the database. Um, so we'll send that out to you. Uh, in the meantime, that is the majority of what we have to show. Uh, it works very well. You know, Feel free to get in there and get your hands dirty. Um, you know, I have this database I spun up, make it easy to copy that, you know, pop over to your terminal, you know, connect right into your database uh, and you're good to go. Um, so thanks for joining us for that. I'm going to hand it back over to Andre to walk through uh, some rest of the content. Hey, hey, Eddie, before you do that, it, is it possible for you to um, re go back to the um, provisioning flow because the polls the poll wasn't it didn't go away so most of us couldn't see you run oh. through that flow sorry yeah, about so, that yeah i feel like i don't know if you can but if you'll dump on your databases and just kind of walk through that first that would be helpful yeah totally sorry about that everyone yeah right so popping back we'll run through that again real quick uh, so again, we made it as easy to use as we can. Same with all of our other products. Uh, if we can't think of a way to do something better than what's out there in the market currently, we're not going to tackle it. And so when we thought of uh, managed databases, you know, we wanted to apply our clean, you know, answer a couple questions, and you get a database, right? It's like Oprah for databases. And so we have the, the you know, the, the very first question is which engine do you want to use? So right now we have Postgres with version 10 and 11. Uh, you pick a node size in here. You know, so let's pick a big beefy cluster and some standby nodes. And now we have a whopping, you know, 64 gigs of RAM, 16 CPU, uh, you know, highly available cluster. We can pick whatever data center we want to deploy that into. Uh, and then we can go and click create, uh, you know, and I think it'll take probably like four to five minutes to spin up all those nodes. And then you have a highly available, you know, fully managed database cluster. Perfect. Thank you. And there are a couple of questions. Hi, this is Tandy. There are a couple of questions um, that were asked that we can probably go through if, if now's a good time, or do you want to wait? Yeah. Uh, are any of them about the roadmap? Because I think that's what Andre's going to talk about next. Yeah. Let me let me walk through the roadmap, and then we'll because um, the roadmap is pretty quick, um, and then we'll jump into these questions. So next slide. Cool. So Postgres is available to you guys today. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed the walkthrough, Eddie, great job. Um, but this is available for usage today and I hope you guys will, will jump in and and, um, and begin using this stuff. 
So we're in a limited availability now, and that's just because there's a couple of additional features we'll be bringing to the table for Postgres um, in the second quarter. And so next up, we're gonna get the Postgres S, the Postgres GA, which we're gonna be adding VPC support, which means that all users will be able to connect um, over private network um, among their droplets and their database infrastructure. Um, I think this is really critical for a number of reasons. Certainly security is a key concern there. And then there's also uh, bandwidth cost, which um, right now, because we're restricted to the public internet, um, you know, we, we have to track all of that bandwidth. Um, but for the year 2019, we have determined to waive those fees. Um, so you want to accrue any bandwidth cost for um, your usage in the year 2019. Um, okay, also in the GA, we're going to be offering some enhanced monitoring. Um, as you saw in Eddie's demo, we're tracking some key metrics right now around load average, CPU usage, storage, um, memory, and I think there's some network in, in, in information there as well. But we're going to dig way deeper into Postgres as we get into this next phase, um, which we're going to be offering things like uh, more information about queries, about locked rows we're going to be getting like much deeper into um, what postgres um, offers around information as well as providing the first layer of alerting um, so you can set your own alerts and be notified when specific conditions that you're interested in are occurring so we're offering cloud firewalls today it is a um, it is 100% um, secure but it is limited in that it is in function 100% the way, in the way that Cloud Firewalls does across the rest of the platform. And so what we wanna do is make sure that the experience of Cloud Firewalls is self-same, so that no matter where you are across the platform, you're experiencing the same usage uh, of Cloud Firewalls. In addition to that, we're gonna be continuing to interview users. We're gonna, hopefully, maybe you guys wanna be a part of those interviews, um, but we wanna continue to make digital ocean managed databases the simplest way, the simplest approach um, to um, removing the friction of building, managing the life cycle of databases in the cloud. So that's what's immediately next. Um, and as you saw in the present, when, as you saw in the demo um, in the provisioning flow, um, we have some coming soon engines. And so also next quarter, we expect to be able to bring the in-memory Redis database uh, to market pretty quickly here. And we are working assiduously here on the DO side to make MySQL available to you as well. We know that MySQL is one of the most used and adopted database engines um, in the world. And so we want to make sure that those users that are specifically interested in bringing MySQL databases, using those databases on the back end, can also be supported by DigitalOcean. So beyond that position, we're going to continue to look into other database engines. Um, I can't make a commitment right now, but we're looking to interesting things like Elasticsearch, like Kafka. And then obviously by listening and continuing to engage with our rich user base, we will continue to iterate the experience of the platform and bring additional features that we think are the most critical um, to our users. And next slide, which I think is QA. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's. Sorry about the. I'm seeing all the the questions about the poll popping. It. Sorry. This is the first time we've used this before. Uh, this tool. Uh, okay. Uh, what kind of downtime can one expect when not using a standby database? Yeah. So. Obviously, when you have a high available, a highly available cluster, then we have automated failover, which means that when a node has an issue, explicitly the primary node, I guess, is the biggest um, worry here then we automatically reroute traffic to one of the standby nodes, and then in the background, replace that primary node with another backup node, right? So that experience should be relatively invisible. But in the case where you do, you have selected not to have standby mode uh, nodes, um, a fell back scenario is engaged, right? So that means that your node goes offline, and it's not just gone, when we obviously we have all the backups and the write-ahead logs, but we, we, there's nothing, we have nothing there to take the place or serve the application in the time that that primary node is coming back online. 
And so the risk that you have there is the time that it will take to restore the node. And that time, it is conditional around the amount of storage that you have in your application. Uh, sorry, in your database, right? So obviously, restoring from backup is dependent on the storage size. Great answer. OK, the next question is, will this be supported with the Terraform config? And the answer is yes, 100%. Uh, part of the roadmap is to uh, add support for our Go library. Uh, and as soon as our Go library has support is when we can build it into our Terraform provider. So uh, do we have an ETA on that? Yeah, so that is part of the Postgres post GA. So that, that very next release we'll have, which is probably two months, not even two months away, we will make sure that the Go library is supported. So folks that are using Terraform definitely can, can engage with that tool. Cool. Uh, can I use a direct external connection to the database? Pretty sure um, the answer is yes, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's available over public IP. And so what you want to do is make sure that using cloud firewalls, you're restricting those inbound connections only to the explicit um, IPs that you want to have access, IPs and droplets and Kubernetes clusters, et cetera. So what happens if they are super successful and fill up the database and they are need to grow it out and add more space in? Yes. So um, as you may have heard, we are using local SSD storage, which makes these, um, these database clusters very performant and fast. So the scale operation is basically invisible. So you can scale these clusters at any time but it is not currently possible to scale only the storage tier. And so basically what you need to do is just go to the next tier, the next size of database cluster at this time. But we are investigating scale at the storage tier, um, but some of that will be, I mean, that'll have to, that will be on the second half of the year. Similar question asking about auto scaling. Yes, so auto scaling specifically um, is something that we're also interested in and there we want to we obviously want to deliver that but I think that this first this last question around storage scaling um, I think it's important to have both of those features available before we get into auto scaling because we want to make sure that users that that only want to scale the storage tier can do that and then we have set specific parameters for how storage is scaled and then separately those that are OK, and actually interested in scaling the entire cluster, which will include CPU and RAM, um, can, can manage those as well. But this is definitely on our roadmap, but it's certainly um, also out into the second half of the year. Cool. Uh, another question about uh, connection pooling and how do you connect an app to it, right? So I'll, I'll do a quick demo. Uh, I'm just going to create a quick connection pool, uh, filled in a few boxes. And so this will actually give me a whole another set of connection parameters uh, that will route all that through PG Bouncer uh, and have everything it needed. So you know it's very seamless to your application that you're using a connection pool. Okay. Uh, is there a way to restore more than seven days from backup? Currently, our rest our retention period is limited to seven days, and so I would love to hear your feedback about this and. Um, if you're interested in, um, after you've tested this service, um, jumping into some of our interviews so we can capture information. Um, it is something that we definitely can um, investigate changing and adding to the service. But for today, um, all services are lim limited to seven, day, seven days of, of backup retention. Uh, is there any way they can download a database backup file? So that is also not possible today, but we have a whole roadmap around backup service, um, which hopefully will include extending the retention period. Um, in order for me to advocate for that, I need to hear you guys' feedback. Um, I need to know that you guys want that stuff. But certainly down the line, we will. our intention is to allow people to take snapshots of their backups or their services, store um, their um, snapshots in spaces. Yeah, a stopgap is obviously you can just do PG backup and restore manually uh, if you need to export that information or a PG dump. Um, I know it's not ideal, but like Andre said, give us the feedback and, and we can try and make that happen. Oh, yeah. Uh, will Postgres extensions need to be installed manually? Um, yes. Yes, and we have a list of extensions Supported. that are supported right in the docs. 
Yep. Uh, so go on and pop right in there. I know some people were happy that we had post just right in, uh, off the bat. Um, so yeah, pop in this list. It's all there. Uh, da -da. Can you assign a password to a user? So we will generate you a random password once you create a user. So I will create an app user, you know, and it will randomly generate a password. Don't hack me. Uh, but you can, you know, you can change that just like you would normally in a Postgres database manually. Um, I think the idea is obviously to build out this page a bit more, Andre. Yeah. So what we want to do is offer more granular access credential, um, access level credentials. Um, so users can create more than just the super user type um, user here. It's also important to note that today, if you, for example, create um, users at the Postgres level. So if you engage with PSQL to um, to manage some of those credentials and create users there, that they will not appear on this page because that will require us to dig in, like to reach in and pull that information out. And we are not doing that today. Any plans for supporting horizontal scaling rather than only vertical? Um, that is a really hard problem, but certainly for you, this is another this is another element where we would love to hear that feedback and one if we learn that that is a key issue that our users are facing then we are certainly interested in doing that but you know sharding is hard but obviously what we're trying to do is really make sure that the hard parts are being discovered and resolved by DigitalOcean so we're certainly interested in solving those problems so please provide your feedback please like bring that to the table um, um, Eddie, do you know the, is it ideas.digitalocean.com, the ideas portal? Yeah, so it is, that is where we collect user feedback and feature requests for our products. So you can come here and submit features that you think are important and their upvotes are really important, right? So that's how we can understand the best way to prioritize based on our user's interest, what to bring to the table um, but I really do appreciate the sentiment. Uh, is there any other way for people to reach out and give feedback if they want to? Um, I think through the support team is probably the mo the, sec the second key way to do that. But I think it's preferable if it's a feature request. And if it's a bug report, you should go through support. But if it's a feature request, it's much more preferable to go to the ideas portal. Because that stuff comes directly to the product team. Uh, and the last question is, will there be support for user groups? Um, so I think user groups are supported on the Postgres side. So you need to engage with PSQL in order to do that. But as I mentioned earlier, um, we are really, I mean, one of, the piece, one of the key pieces of feedback that we heard through the beta, which we were not able to get into this release, um, is, is, a, is a much more granular um, capability of managing users, groups, and databases from the dashboard. So we are definitely interested in working towards that goal. Will there be smaller or more affordable cluster options available for cases where each client needs their own separate infrastructure? Um, so um, we heard a little bit about this in the beta as well. So right now, the smallest cluster that can be built starts at the two gig um, size, which is minimally $50 a month. Um, and we realize that that's a little high. And so we realize that uh, that actually I don't think it's a high cost, but I think that it's a it's a difficult first step for many teams that have much lower infrastructure requirements. Um, there are some real ch technical challenges for um, including some of these management features in a service that has such low RAM, uh, let's, such a low memory footprint. Um, we are actively engaging in this question because we have gotten feedback in this side. Um, but it is it is an it is unknown to presently. I don't know today whether it is technically feasible for us to do that. Um, but I know that there is it's important for us, and we are investigating it actively. Yeah, yeah. Our goal is always to make things as cheap as, as we can, right? <laughs> yep. So hopefully we get there. Uh, those are the only questions that are left. 
if anyone has any last minute ones, feel free to drop them in. Uh, I'm going to share something fun uh, before we wrap up. So I was reading through the docs for something in Postgres. And so there's this extract function that you can have for a, you know, a, a source. And so when you want to extract dates around, uh, if you want to pull out the century, uh, there's this actually really funny quote down here in the docs. I'll just read it real quick. It says, the first century starts at 0, 1. Although they did not know this at the time, this definition applies to all Gregorian countries. Uh, there is no century number 0. You go from negative 1 to 1 century. If you disagree with this, please write your complaint to Pope, Cathedral Saints, Peter, Roma, Vatican. So uh, if you want to you know, file a complaint on that one, feel free to mail the Pope. <laughs> Uh, oh, we got one more question. It is, are managed databases any more performant than an equivalent droplet? Um, so it depends on how you construct your drop. If you're rolling your own, it's dependent on a number of details, right? So how you configure the droplet, if, I mean, if you have determined to use a persistent disk would be important there. And then also the type of application that you're running, all these things might impact the performance. Um, and so I would, I, my, my sentiment is that it probably isn't faster to have managed database, but I'm sure that it is simpler to, <laughs> to have managed databases, um, especially if uptime, if backup and recovery and not having to deal with those on your own are, are important. I'm sure it is simpler thing to do. And I, and I'm sure that users who select managed databases will sleep easier. And I think that's one of the key things, literally from, from our beta interviews and our pre-beta interviews, users said, the thing I want the most um, is to sleep through the night and know that even if an issue happens with my data tier, my application will continue to run in the morning. And that's the thing that we, that's a key thing that we wanted to solve with managed databases. Uh, and Andre mentioned earlier, like this is deployed on our core compute prop platform and product, right? So um, it's roughly around the same stuff. You're, yeah. you're getting the same hardware, the same storage, the same drives um, as you would if you would do it yourself. So yep. uh, two more questions. Uh, can you customize your postgres.conf file? Nope, we will not. We cannot currently offer um, customizations of the conf file, but that is a request that has been coming in. And so we are um, actively entertaining the idea and trying to figure out the best way to provide access to that file. And is the Postgres instance pre-tuned or a default install? It is pre-tuned. So it is tuned based on the size of the infrastructure that's been selected. Cool. Those are all the questions. Cool. We want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, hopefully, this was useful. Uh, we'll send out the slides and a link to the recording uh, and a bunch of the resources that we mentioned. Yeah, we're super excited to have you guys here. We're glad to hear about your interest. Um, if you guys are interested in participating in interviews and giving your feedback once you delved into the product of it, we would love to learn from you um, more about what you'd like to see coming in the future, because that's the best way for us to deliver a product uh, that meets your needs. One last question. Do you provide any insight into index usage? So we do not currently provide that, but that is a part of the plan, the deeper metrics plan I mentioned on the roadmap for that next, that very next release. So when we hit the Postgres GA, I think it will be in April. Um, we will definitely be providing much more insight into index indexes. Cool. Uh, and uh, should they keep this webinar uh, secret? No, we're going to post this. So yeah, you'll feel free to share this. Uh, and then how shall people contact if they want to participate in an interview with you, Andre? Um, how? Yes. So I can work with the team and get the email, get in, get the list of emails, and I'll ping you all, all directly. I don't necessarily want to put my email on this <laughs> webinar, <laughs> but I'll reach out to all of you guys. For sure. So I'll get that from the from the uh, customer success team, and I'll reach out to you guys so you know how to reach me directly. Cool. All Thanks right. again for joining us, everyone. Yep. Thank you, guys. Thanks, um, guys. Feel free to reach out to your customer success or 
um, any of your, your contacts at DO if you have any specific follow-up questions or would like to um, engage with Andre or, or Eddie and we'll pass that on. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Here's all.